Tonight, Newsnight begins a two-part investigation into one of the most emotive issues in contemporary Britain. Government figures released this week show that over three and a quarter million experiments were carried out on animals last year. The creatures involved range from monkeys, cats and dogs, through to rats, mice and birds. The whole subject's shrouded in secrecy and Britain is reckoned to have some of the tightest controls on animal experiments in the world. But as Janet Truin reports, all is not as it seems. To protect the identities of a number of scientists involved in this work, their faces have been obscured. Some of the pictures in Janet Truin's report may be distressing to some viewers. All these animals are bred to be killed for science. The procedures range from simple blood tests to complex operations, which even when done in the most professional way can involve severe pain. Almost everything we wear or eat, our medicines and industrial processes, are first tested on animals. Successive governments have accepted the necessity. This government passed a law to ensure the killing was humane. This is the Animal Scientific Procedures Act of 1986, supposedly the toughest regulations on animal experimentation anywhere in the world. It sets up a three-tier system of licensing, people to care for the welfare of the animals, plus a national home office inspectorate. It's been gradually coming into force over the last three years and finally became fully operational in January of this year. And yet, just two months ago, extraordinary events here at one of Britain's top research establishments has seriously called into question the very credibility of this act. And now the claims come thick and fast. The act is not working, experimentation is poor, and the animals are suffering needlessly. There are 600 people at the National Institute for Medical Research and thousands of animals. It's funded by the government and is one of the 375 establishments nationally that are licensed to experiment on animals. Until May this year, one of the most highly respected scientists in the country was doing diabetes research in this room. Professor Wilhelm Feldberg, CBE, Fellow of the Royal Society, expert on nerve cells, winner of the Wellcome Gold Medal in January. But these pictures brought his work to a sudden conclusion. They were taken earlier this year by two animal welfare campaigners who infiltrated his laboratory. Professor Feldberg used three rabbits a week the procedure, passed by the Home Office and the Institute itself under the 1986 Act, was that each was to be given an anaesthetic, the rabbit's body was to be heated, and the rise in blood sugar levels monitored. It would then be humanely killed. But what the campaigners saw was rabbits twitching and wriggling whilst they should have been unconscious. They produced hours of distressing videotape now in the hands of the Home Office. <laughs> Mike Huskerson, who does not want to be identified because of other animal investigations, found the events of April the 23rd this year particularly horrifying. Well, that was um, a standard heating experiment with a rabbit, the aim being to bring a lamp close to the stomach of the animal and uh, produce a burn and see how the blood sugar level rose. Uh, but it was particularly distressing to myself because there were numerous occasions on that day where the rabbit was pure, poorly anaesthetised and um, certainly on one occasion that really comes to mind in the morning where Professor Felberg was trying to insert a tube into the neck of the rabbit in order to ventilate it, to pump air into its lungs, um, the animal was clearly moving and I said to him, well it looks likely anaesthetised to me, it's not properly anaesthetised Professor and uh, he took the view that he could carry on and he proceeded to do that without giving it any further anaesthetic and uh, put the tube into the neck of the animal even though it was twitching and jolting at every incision into its body. The two investigators also claimed that the professor at 89, the oldest license holder in the country, had eyesight so poor that he couldn't see the veins for injection had difficulty with simple procedures. Inserting a tube took 24 minutes instead of the normal five minutes. It said he frequently dozed between readings and was using an anaesthetic, Sagatal, nowadays regarded as unsuitable for the purpose. It all happened whilst an experienced technician was there. We contacted both, 
neither had any comment to make. The evidence is held at the offices of the Scottish organisation Advocates for Animals, a group that cooperated with the Home Office in setting up the act in the first place. 40 hours of tape are in their safe. They have challenged the scientific need for Professor Felberg's experiments, and they believe that under the act, the Home Office should have questioned what he was doing. Why did the Home Office even allow them to use a desk lamp to burn an animal? to 130 degrees centigrade, and you must remember burning point is 100 degrees centigrade, and then the technician in the videotape re refers to the animals being cooked. Why on earth did they not stop that? It's also interesting uh, to note that none of the animals actually reached the actual end point of the experiment to which Professor Felberg and his assistant were looking at. All of them died before they reached that, either because the professor had given them far too much anaesthetic, or because the shock of the heating killed the animals. They never, ever reached it. By law, three named people in the Institute should have known what was happening, including the head of NIMR and a named vet. Dr. David Rees heads the prestigious Medical Research Council, which runs the Institute. The Council hands out millions of pounds of government grants to scientists every year. Professor Feldberg and his assistant have now returned their licenses, and an inquiry has been set up. It is uh, very difficult, I think, to uh, make up one's mind just from looking at the video as to whether there has been a serious infringement, uh, any infringement indeed at all. Uh, and it's for this reason that I've set up uh, uh, an independent inquiry. Do you accept then that something was wrong in Professor Felberg's laboratory and in his procedures? Not until the uh, result of the inquiry has been completed. I mean, there clearly is evidence in that video that's got to be taken very seriously indeed. And but we'll it, do that in inquiry. But what you see with your own eyes in the video is not sufficient to convince you that something was actually wrong in that laboratory? N not 100 percent, no. This is not the view of the British Veterinary Association spokesman on laboratory animal welfare. Professor David Morton was instrumental in drafting the act and has seen the Feldberg film. The animals that were inadequately anaesthetized, I think their condition was poor, and I don't think it should ever have been permitted. You think they, were, inad have you think they were inadequately anaesthetized? Yes, I think they were in inadequately anaesthetized. Is that clear from the film? Yes, the bits I've seen where it shows the animal trying to get up shows quite distinctly that the animal was too lightly anaesthetized. And I don't think it was Professor Feldberg's intention, in fact, to allow the animal to recover to that extent. But there was this problem of using Sagatel as an anaesthetic. And had he used other sorts of anaesthetic, I don't believe he would have had the same problem. The Act was meant to prevent such things happening. It established Home Office inspectors to ensure that best laboratory practice like this was carried out. Currently, there are 20,000 scientists and technicians licensed to use animals in experiments. There are 18 inspectors. Between January and May this year, Five visits were made to NIMR, yet the situation continued. But it seems there were qualms in official circles about Professor Felberg's experiments. Newsnight understands that at the turn of the year, he was advised to start using rabbits instead of cats because the process was simpler. I can't discuss the uh, allegation that the, that the Home Office knew that uh, there was something suspect about uh, Professor Feldberg's work. I mean, that's just not true. But can you explain how it was that um, Professor Feldberg had originally been working with cats and was then advised to start using rabbits? Can you tell me why that happened? We do have a policy uh, in the operation of the Act that wherever, um, that if it's necessary to use cats in order to uh, do ex important experimental work which will advance medical science and ultimately benefit people and animals, then cats should be used. But if uh, equivalent research can be done with another species, then we, another species should be used. And it's a result of detailed scientific discussions of whether rabbits would substitute uh, that it was finally agreed that he should move over onto rabbits. So the reason for him changing from one species to another was not to do with how capable Professor Feldberg was, but was to do with... Oh, oh certainly not. He wouldn't have got a project or a personal license if he 
uh, hadn't been judged capable. So there had never been any question about how competent or otherwise Professor Felberg was? Uh, that is correct. So when you saw the video, it came as a complete shock to you? Uh, why did you say so? Well, you had, you had never thought that Professor Felberg's work was anything other than perfectly safe and of the highest standard? Until the inquiry which I've set up is completed, I don't know whether there has been uh, any infringement of the act in those experiments. But others had witnessed the professor's experiments with concern. Newsnight has acquired a letter submitted in evidence to the MRC inquiry now underway. It's from a vice president of the Humane Society of the United States, a British qualified vet, Dr. Michael Fox. It reveals that he had seen the professor operating on a cat on November the 8th last year. He makes a list of criticisms culminating in this allegation. When the experiment was terminated, Professor Feldberg did not euthanize the cat, but instead began dissecting it to locate the splanchnic nerves, which I saw had not been completely severed. At this time, his assistant said, with a tone of concern, Oh, you're doing a live dissection today, Professor. He then cut into the cat's thorax, causing an immediate pneumothorax, at which time the cat began to struggle. With shaking hands, he pulled out the cat's heart and severed it with scissors. Dr. Fox concludes the scientific community should be held responsible for the harm done to Professor Feldberg's reputation and to have to terminate a distinguished career on such a negative note. The mounting evidence of errors is causing grave concern amongst the government's own advisers on the Animal Procedures Committee, a panel of experts set up to ensure the act works. Clive Holland, for many years an animal welfare campaigner, is worried. The system failed. Everybody involved has to bear some responsibility for that. I still think that it is a good act. Uh, I stake my reputation on it, and I still think that we have a good act, and because something falls down, the system fails once, doesn't mean that the act's a bad one. It means you have to find out why it went wrong. As I said, it's not the act that is, has failed, it's the administration that's failed. But there's a second question that's not about the policing of the 86 Act, but about the very reasons for the experiments. This is the Huntington Research Centre, the largest commercial contract testing laboratory of its kind in Europe, covering 85 acres of Cambridgeshire. There are thousands of animals here, undergoing tests to assess the toxicity of anything from pesticides to toothpaste. This fortress, too, has been infiltrated by an animal investigator. This time, the evidence raises fundamental questions about the way the Home Office approves the experiments themselves. The issue involves Section 5.4, a clause that goes to the very heart of the legislation. It's a kind of conscience clause. It orders the Home Secretary to weigh the likely adverse effects on the animals concerned against the benefit likely to accrue. The intention is to eradicate unnecessary suffering. Well, this one um, involved young beagle dogs um, going through a, a skin toxicity test. For eight months, Sarah Kite, a campaigner for the British Union for the Abolition of Vivisection, worked as a helper at HRC, keeping detailed records. She believes it's clear that the government is too willing to accept a test should be done if a commercial company tells them so. What about this picture here? What's that? Well, this experiment being conducted on beagles was uh, an acute toxicity experiment using a substance called Arcon, which was described as being a component used in, in some sort of cling film wrapping used in contact with food. Now these dogs were being force fed the substance each day in capsules. They were fed up to nine of these large, large capsules were forced down their throats each day. If they vomited or regurgitated the capsules back up, they were forced back and they were continuously forced back down until finally the dog swallowed them. Kite says she witnessed numerous other tests which the BUAV believe should never have been given licenses because in their view, the suffering caused far outweighed the benefits to mankind. Substance, canthazanthin, a food colouring also used in some suntan creams, banned in some countries, under review here. 
Rats turned orange, became swollen. Feces and urine turned red. Substance, dimethoate, a highly toxic insecticide, a one-year study on beagle dogs. The animals were described as thin, visibly shaking, vomiting, diarrhea, hair standing on end, blood on the floor. Substance, fluctotrazepam, a new tranquilizer, a two-year test on rats. Symptoms, paralyzed hind limbs, fitting, blood on floor, rats described by a technician as rotting but alive. HRC refused to be interviewed, saying they were concerned for the safety of their scientists and had to respect the confidentiality of their clients. They did, however, allow us inside without cameras. During our visit, lasting six hours, HRC confirmed to us that the tests spoken of by Sarah Kite did in fact take place. They said they were all valid experiments within the terms of the act and that newspaper reports afterwards had been emotive and biased. Whilst we were inside, we were shown tests on many animals, rats, mice, rabbits, dogs, monkeys and baboons. For reasons of commercial secrecy, we could not be told the purpose or the substances involved. One, though, we saw involved beagle dogs inhaling the contents of an aerosol can through a tube pushed down the throat. It was to discover an alternative to damaging CFCs. The company claims it always minimizes the suffering and has on occasion even turned down work it doesn't approve of. Recently, HRC announced they would no longer test cosmetics, but campaigners still insist that generally repetitious and unnecessary experiments are continuing to get licenses. Section 5.4, first of all, requires the Home Secretary, when considering a project li license application, to have regard to the adverse effects on the laboratory animals and weigh them against the potential benefits to society. Now, of course, it must be said that is potentially a very effective provision. But in our opinion, it is simply not being applied in any way near st strict enough fashion. For example, can it be said that the benefits of food colourings, the colourings in my tie, lipsticks, mascaras, oven cleaners, shoe polishes, etc., are so important to society that they outweigh the very intense and severe suffering to laboratory animals. Professor David Morton sees the act very differently. He is himself a license holder and is responsible for 700 others in his laboratories. He feels the legislation means that the use of animals must be justified as never before. The act, he says, gives animals rights whilst allowing research to go on. If we take a red dye, for example, that is produced in a factory, that red dye may be used in dyes on people's clothes, it may be used in cosmetics, it may be used in medicines, it may be used as paint, it may be used as a food colorant. In all those situations, it would have been tested to make sure that it's not going to give us cancer or give us um, some sort of untoward effect. So in a way, the whole of our society is built on this um, hill of safety which has been generated through research on animals and we can't escape it. Never will escape it. Well, never is a long time, isn't it? I think the answer is we, we've always got the option of saying we know enough now, that's enough. We don't need to do any more um, animal research because we don't need to develop any more chemicals. And we stultify society at, the, you know, at this level now. And maybe that is an option. For cosmetics testing, for example, some people consider that is a very serious option. But while we've got cardiovascular disease around, while we've got cancer around, while we've got schistosomiasis out in the third world, don't let's forget the diseases in the third world because looking at it from our European eyes, we forget sometimes that millions of people are dying of other diseases there. We need to do research to eliminate those human diseases. The Animal Scientific Procedures Act of 1986 was intended to strike the balance between the welfare of animals and the pursuit of valuable scientific work but growing dissatisfaction with the implementation of it brings demands for yet stronger supervision. Tomorrow we look at further worrying evidence from a study of more than 300 experiments which suggests that scientists should no longer be left alone to make decisions about animal suffering. We've placed our trust in the inspectors, in the Home Office, in the scientific community with that new act to regulate themselves and to make sure that laboratory animals would be looked after properly. Unfortunately, that trust has been betrayed. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the only time laboratory animals will be safe is when there's no experimentation whatsoever, because 
I genuinely feel, and I, and I regret to say this, that at the present time, the scientific community cannot be trusted. And in tomorrow's program, we continue our investigation into the use of animals in science. We reveal that thousands of them are living in laboratory conditions that are below the government's own guidelines. And we ask, will we always have to test animals to destruction?